everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. It's so great to see you in person. We have we really miss having our in-person events at the library, so this is really great. Um, we are thrilled to welcome Jess Walter, author of The Cold Millions, to the Beaverton City Library as part of our fourth annual One Book, One Beaverton community-wide read. We would like to recognize the new friends of the Beaverton City Library for their generous support of this program. And to library and city staff who have helped make one book happen, we heartily thank you. I'd like to give a special shout out to staff members Emma Jones, Megan Cohen, Blaine Ross, and Jenny Chamberlain. And finally, to all of, I'm sorry, excuse me. And finally, to all of you for your support of One Book and the library, we can't thank you enough. You're the reason we do this work and why we enjoy it so much. So a few housekeeping things before we get started. This event is being recorded and live streamed. So big hello to everybody that's watching out there from home. Um, please silence your cell phones if you've not done so already. We would love to get your feedback feedback about one book. Um, so you can do that by um, filling out a survey as you exit, or you can also fill out one online. Mr. Walter will be happy to answer your questions at the end of his talk. Please raise, raise your hand to ask your question and stand if you're able as it will help with being heard. And finally, we would like to invite you to join us upstairs after the program to get your book signed by the author. And now we'll begin with a short film made by Mr. Walter about the book and Spokane. Where the novelist steps in to ask, what are they all doing down there? 
The story I set out to tell was based on real events. The free speech riots of 1909 in Spokane, and the Wallabies, the industrial workers of the world, the first union to take women, freed slaves, Native Americans, anyone with a job could be a Wobbly. It's a story of social unrest, of police brutality, of deep inequality, of the ache of wanting a better world, issues that resonate today. The IWW was outlawed from speaking and organizing on the streets. In Spokane, Wobbly staged the first successful nonviolent protests in US history, a model for civil rights leaders and other peaceful activists. Speeches dissolved into riots, police and private goons beat protesters, there were mass arrests, 500 people locked up, the jails so full they threw prisoners in an old high school. The Cold Millions is the story of Gig and Rye Dolan, adventuring vagrant brothers who get swept up in this turbulent class warfare. It's also the story of two women they meet. Ursula the Great, who sings on a vaudeville stage with a live cougar, and the labor activist and suffragist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a courageous, pregnant 19-year-old who comes to Spokane to lead the fight for justice. My research involved books, academic papers, letters, hundreds of newspapers, but in Spokane you can walk right through history, like walking through a neighborhood filled with the mansions of mining magnates a simple clabbered house where Spokane's police chief was shot to death through the window by an assassin. The ghosts are everywhere. Even though it's fiction, I began to think of this novel as a loose origin story for my hometown, connecting the place we are now to the place we were then. But it's also a kind of origin story for my own working class family. Both of my grandfathers were itinerant workers in the West who found their way to Eastern Washington a generation later. My dad was a steelworker and union leader for 40 years. It's the truth of both history and historical fiction, I think, that the deeper you look into the past, the more you find yourself encountering the present moment. I know that was the case with the cold millions. These themes of progress, our endless struggle for social equality. They churn at the heart of this novel the way the Spokane River cuts through my western city, unceasing and inevitable, carving a path through time and stone to the ocean. Thank you for visiting my town. I hope you enjoy the cold nights. We were initially drawn to The Cold Millions because of its surprising timeliness, even though it takes place in 1909. With its focus on issues such as free speech, wealth inequality, corruption, police brutality, and labor rights, issues that we still struggle with today, it seemed a natural choice to spark meaningful community conversations. We also appreciated that this is a regional book written by a regional author that focuses on a fascinating part of the Pacific Northwest history. And last but not least, it's a great read. 
we were mesmerized by this well-crafted, entertaining story filled with unforgettable characters. Jess Walter began his writing career as a reporter and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for his work covering Ruby Ridge. He is the author of nine books and was a finalist for the National Book Award and a winner of the Edgar Award. We are honored to have him with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jess Walter. Thank you, everyone. Two, two microphone stands and one microphone. That's, uh, I don't think I've ever spent so much time backstage. Thanks for uh, sitting through the film. Um, uh, I made that in part because um, working on a book during a pandemic, um, I realized I wasn't going to get to do one of my favorite parts of, uh, of the whole publishing experience, which is the book tour. I generally love getting out and talking about the work that I've just finished, the thing I've been obsessed with. I'm probably a little bit more of an extrovert than most authors, in fact, um, than all authors, I, I would probably say. Um, so it's great to get out and get to go to different cities and talk about the book. And because I knew I wouldn't be able to do that, uh, I spent an entire book tour Zooming. Um, I decided I would do this. I would create a film that sort of showed you the place that the book comes from. If I couldn't go out to those cities, maybe I could bring them to you. Um, I want to thank everyone from the Beaverton Library, uh, uh, Jenny and Ann, and, um, and all of you for coming. Um, I, I really love to do readings. I dedicated this book to my dad, uh, who was a lifelong steel worker and um, a ninth grade dropout himself, so he wasn't a huge reader. And uh, I'll never forget his sort of confusion that I was going to be going and doing events and reading. Um, uh, you know, he, as a guy who hadn't really read very many books, he, he said, what do you do at these things? I said, well, I, I go out, I talk about the book, sometimes I read from it. And he said, wrote the damn thing and you have to read it to him too? So I assured my dad that I wouldn't read very often, that usually I would just talk about the book. Uh, he also was um, uh, sort of famously used to give me wan ads up until just a few years ago um, because he just couldn't imagine that someone could make a living doing this. So. Um, uh, I also wanted to show that, that video because it really um, talks about sort of the genesis of the book for me, which was my home city, Spokane. Growing up in Spokane, as I did in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, um, was a strange time. Spokane's population had flattened in about 1910 um, through the 30s, uh, had even fallen, had risen a bit in the 40s and 50s with World War II and uh, Fairchild Air Force Base and Kaiser Aluminum, where my dad worked. But by the time I came up in the 1980s, uh, Spokane felt uh, like an overgrown ghost town in some ways, um, barely larger than it had been uh, 60, 70 years earlier. In 1905, Portland and Spokane had the same population. And in fact, if you were from New York or Chicago, you would have seen Spokane as a far more sophisticated place, a better stage town, more progressive. Um, the, the city, of course, that I grew up in felt like the opposite of those places. And one of the things that I really found myself wondering with this book, as I, as I worked at the newspaper in Spokane, as I sort of, as the city um, became my stomping ground, was how does this place exist, this incredible turn of the century architecture, these streets where you can tell buildings have been taken out, um, where a once thriving place existed. Uh, as a reporter, I had, I had come across um, the, the labor strife in 1909, uh, and I was sort of fascinated that this had occurred in this place that I had grown up. Um, Spokane was one of those points on, on um, uh, one of those points in labor history and progressive history um, where, a, where a victory had been won, a, a rare thing. Um, uh, certainly in labor history. And, and it was something that I had always, always filed away and thought might be something that I would write about at some, at some point. 
the other thing that I really wanted to sort of recapture was the vibrant feel of the city. Those postcards with the teeming streets, um, the, the one that I, that I showed that we then dissolved into the, into the city the way they are now. Um, one of those postcards said, um, the cut line on it was, a, a day in progressive Spokane, Washington. And that always amazed me and, and made me want to sort of explore that, that time and that era. The other thing that really drove me to the book, the other real origin of it for me was political, was a sense that things in the country had slipped to this, to this, um, uh, had slipped to this, to this status that I hadn't seen before. And when I looked back at 1909, I found so many echoes of what felt like the political moment that we were in now, um, starting with income inequality. Um, we had arrived at a point in American history when the gap between the richest and the poorest was the same that it was in 1909, the same time as this story that I wanted to tell. The, we had arrived at a point in which we were talking again about voting rights, about various kinds of civil rights, um, and uh, about activism, about, uh, a, a, about a, the conflicts that, that drive us apart as people. We all know how close the United States came to, to or we all know that the United States had a civil war um, in the 1800s. What we don't know is how close the country came to dividing itself again during this period, during this period of labor strife, of, um, of the demand for civil rights, of income inequality. Across the West, there were bombings, there were, there were gunfights. Um, the labor wars of the early 1900s were something I hadn't learned about in school. Um, I had, I, uh, like most of us, I think, for me, it felt as if we went from the Civil War to the Old West to all of a sudden World War I uh, or maybe the Depression. History seemed to skip over this entire period, and so did literature. Um, when I thought back to the books that I had read, this early, the early 1900s were a period that, that felt to me um, underreported and, uh, and not written about nearly as often as, um, as other periods. So as I started to work on this idea on this book, it was a way to, to look at issues that I felt bedeviled the country now, um, but, but in a way that would, the way fiction does through empathy, hopefully, open up those stories, not just be throwing another tweet on the fire and saying, you know, income inequality seems like a bad thing. Um, you know, the, the issues of homelessness, of, of vagrancy, you know, the, this was a way to write about them in, and to place them in historical context and hopefully to, to have people see within history the cycles, the way these things come back around. The other thing that happened was in November of 2016, I sent both of my daughters, my adult daughters, a note saying, congratulations, tomorrow you'll wake up with the first female president. What a world we live in that um, in 1910, you wouldn't have had the right to vote, and now a woman is about to be elected president. Neither one of them ever let me forget that, by the way. Um, not the last time that their dad has been wrong, and certainly not the first time. But as I, as I, over the over the next few years, both of my daughters would um, would talk to me quite a bit about activism, about what it meant to protest, about what it meant um, to want the country that you live in to feel different. And I would think so much about this story. Um, I always thought when I was a parent that my kids would have to rebel in some ways. And being a fairly liberal person myself, I was so fearful that they would become conservative. But it turns out, as a parent, there's, you can never be more liberal than your kids. They still look at me like I'm Richard Nixon or something. Um, trying to convince my kids that a vote for Joe Biden might be OK was um, akin to, to um, getting them to, to sign up for the Republican Party, almost. So. Um, so t having this conversation with my kids about the direction of the country, the meaning of progress, the place in which you fight for the things you care about, I found myself thinking back to this figure who existed in Spokane in 1909, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. 
Now, those of you who've read the novel know that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is, in many ways, although she's not the protagonist of the novel, she is kind of the hero. Um, Gurley Flynn was uh, a labor activist um, who came from New York and from the time she was a teenager, from the time she was 15, she was a leader in, in fighting for, um, uh, for workers' rights across the country. Left home and found herself in work camps in Minnesota and Montana, and eventually as a pregnant 19-year-old in Spokane, Washington. Her leadership of, of the free speech movement in Spokane in 1909 and 1910 really turned the tide. Um, the police had cracked down on these peaceful protests and had arrested more than 500 and jailed them. Had, people had died. Um, they, there, were no, there were really no more protesters showing up when Elizabeth Gurley Flynn sort of took over the mantle of this protest. And I so wanted my daughters to encounter a figure like that, who through audacity and the force of her personality could could find herself battling in a world in which she didn't even have the right to vote, to own property, um, and yet could, could find herself mustering the courage and the energy um, to keep battling for the world she saw. Um, the, the, one of my favorite moments in the book, um, which, also, which actually comes from her autobiography, is when, when um, she's talking about the way newspapers have referred to her. One paper called her an East Side Joan of Arc. Um, and my favorite, the New York Times reference to her was as a she-dog of anarchy. The New York Times at the time being a, an establishment newspaper that found her activities to be uh, um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty abhorrent. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the things I did when I finished the novel was buy for my daughters and my wife She-Dog of Anarchy t-shirts, which um, they all wear proudly. When you discover a character like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the novel that you're trying to write, um, a couple things happen though. Number one, um, she overpowered so many of the, of the things in the novel. I, I had always known that I wanted the novel to be about these two brothers. Um, one, of the, one of the dedications, as I said, is to my dad, who was a long time uh, uh, labor um, uh, officer himself, um, and, and whose favorite genre was the Western. My dad loved Westerns. Um, we lived next to a drive-in theater, and, he, and uh, I can't tell you how many times we would sit in my tree fort and watch Clint Eastwood movies. Or, um, and so this was, a, this was a kind of story that I knew my dad loved. And as I was writing this late 19th century, early 20th century world, I wanted to write a late period Western, the very end of this Western moment when a city like Spokane is moving from this frontier rough place where the police chief can still be shot to death in the town to a much more modern city. Uh, and so as I'm writing the story about these two brothers, this adventuring um, story, I'm, I'm peopling it with people like Del Dalvo because I, I really want that, that Western feel. I want the pull of an adventure story. Uh, and I start, I start realizing that, that if this is a Western and I have a stranger riding into town, then Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is in a way my Clint Eastwood, uh, riding into town demanding the emancipation of the vagina just like Clint Eastwood always did. And that was both thrilling to me, but also stopped me cold a little bit. Because when you get a character this powerful um, at the center of a book, it, it, it can change um, everything in a way, especially a, a historical, real historical figure like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And I so wanted to honor the fact that this person really existed, that I had never learned about her in school, that there's no monument to her in Spokane, that I, I really worked to do what I had never done in fiction before, which was to make the character as realistic to the real person as possible, as close to the real person as, she, as I could possibly create her. It's still a fictional version of that character, but most of the things, most of the speeches that she gives, most of the places that she go really occurred in history. And I did that um, as a way of sort of um, 
honoring what I felt was my responsibility as a former journalist, as someone who loves history, to, to, to pass on this real figure within this fictional world. Most of the real characters in here, the police chief, John Sullivan, um, the labor lawyers, the, um, the other activists, I, I tried not to mess with them. I tried to let Gig and Rye's fictional story exist alongside their real stories. The other thing I really wanted to do within this labor Western that was forming in my mind was, was to have a 19th century feel like that postcard. I wanted my novel to teem. I wanted it to, I wanted the streets to feel packed. I wanted it to feel as if it was bursting with the voices of the 19th and early 20th century. And so as I often do when I'm writing a novel, I began to envision um, a, a motif that works both thematically and structurally. I'll, and I'll explain what I mean. For me, the motif of this novel was the Spokane River. It's the reason that picture of the falls is on the cover. It's the reason that much of the action takes place around the river from the, the chronological beginning of the book, 1864 at Plants Ferry to 1964, 100 years later when Rye lives alongside the river. That river to me, besides being the most dominant feature in Spokane, any of you who have been there know there's a series of beautiful waterfalls right at the center. It's the reason the city is there, of course. That, besides being the central thing about Spokane, it became the central, the central metaphor for the novel. The, I began to see those third person sections following the two brothers, Rye and Gig Dolan, the vagrants who wake up on a ball field and who get dragged into this labor battle as it happens, I began to see their stories as, as the main channel of the river. And then I, I was able to write these teeming sections, these other first person sections that come in like tributaries or undercurrents, um, like creeks that feed this larger river. And in that way, I was able to hopefully create um, a, a, a sort of chorus of Spokane, voices like Jules, the Spokane Indian who works in the camps um, who, and who remembers when there was no city there, um, rem remembers that Spokane, like so many places, is a city named for the people driven from it. I was able to create someone like Del Dalvo to, to people my story with uh, a villain, um, uh, a Pinkerton detective who, like many of those Pinkerton detectives, had come from England and spoke in a, in a vernacular that no longer existed. And, and I was also able to create the character of Ursula the Great, uh, Gig's girlfriend, who was such great fun to write and who represented the, the vaudeville theaters that were throughout Spokane during um, moving from west to east in Spokane were a series of 10 theaters that had um, entertainment as highbrow as opera on the west end and as lowbrow as Ursula the Great singing and dancing with a wild cougar on the far east end. And in creating a character like Ursula the Great, I was also able to balance out um, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's um, dynamic character. It's when you write a, when you write someone like that who is so singular, who exists so far outside what life would have been like for most women in 1909, just through her sheer audacity and courage, um, then that becomes the, almost the only model for female agency. And I really wanted with Ursula the Great to create another kind of female agency. I also had to had to. Um, answer the question of how it was she didn't get eaten by the cougar. Uh, and so came up with the probably the most brilliant fictional idea I've ever had, which was that she sews meat in the corset of her, uh, of her costume every night. When, when you're working on a novel like this, the very first step is research. Uh, I love what the great novelist Richard Powers says about this. He was talking about his novel, The Overstory, and an interviewer asked him, do you find that you get lost in the research? And Powers said a thing that I think is so true. He said, oh my goodness, no, I get found in the research. And I think that's so true. And that the, the two, three, four years that I spent researching this novel bent over 
newspaper microfilm, reading every book I could on the subject, um, re reading unpublished dissertations and letters, um, searching, ev searching every library in the Northwest that I could find, looking at plat maps. All of that period was so productive. And you find yourself not necessarily looking for the entire story, but trying to find a sort of fluency in 1909. What would it have sounded like? Where would the trains have gone? Um, what, where would these people have come from? And, and in the midst of that research, often you find yourself in a kind of dream state. And this was how I found myself in Spokane, walking through the city in 2017, 2018, 2019, but really walking through the 1909 city. And I think of this book in many ways as almost a walking history of Spokane. Most of the locations of the novel you could go to today. You could walk right through Riverfront Park where those rail lines stopped, where Gig and Rye would have jumped on the trains. You can go to Hilliard, the other big rail yard, um, and still see trains on sidings. You can go to the Davenport Hotel and see the ho see the restaurant where Rye would um, where Rye's thrown out. You can um, it, you can of course go to the falls and the courthouse and so many of those places. And that's really what the research led to for me was this was this walkabout through my own city. And I still remember the day I was walking and I looked up and I realized I was on the street where John Sullivan, the police chief of Spokane, was shot to death in his uh, front window in 1911. And I stood in front of the very house and looked through the very window, where, uh, well, not the same glass, obviously, but the same window frame where he had been sitting that day when, the, when a bullet passed through his back and landed in his lap and he took it and set it on the table and calmly got up and called the police department to report that a shooting had occurred and to give his address. The lieutenant saying, but John, that's your address. And he said, yes, I've been shot. And that, that moment of seeing that history was so incredible for me and, and, and really made me understand that the novel I was writing was steeped in that moment and in the moment we're in now. Those echoes that I found of the politics echoed in so many different ways. We think, I thought, that we had sort of invented this fractured media that you choose your politics based on whether you wanna watch Fox News or you wanna watch MSNBC. But if you ex had existed in 1909, you would choose your news based on the newspaper. There would be newsboys on the street selling the Spokane Chronicle or the, the Spokesman Review, the establishment newspapers that would tell you that these, that these vagrants who were disrupting things in Spokane were in fact foreigners, dirty foreigners bringing bad ideas. Um, or you could get the labor newspaper, the Spokane Press, published by Hearst, that would tell you that this, that no, these were people fighting for fair wages, that they were being abused, and they were being abused and mistreated by the Spokane police. You could read the Industrial Worker, a newspaper that would go even further, that would push along um, ideas that, uh, that perhaps um, the ownership of, of, of wealth should go to the people who actually did the work. And, and in every way I kept encountering as like this walkabout, um, I kept encountering the, the very same ghosts that I felt like inhabited the novel. By the time I, I came here for this trip, I've sort of decided that this is the way to encounter um, history in the Northwest. Uh, we live so much in a world that was formed 110, 120, 130 years ago, usually right after the fire that burned everything that was wood and caused them to rebuild in brick. Uh, and so it was with great joy that I went to the Spokane Historical Society, or the uh, Oregon Historical Society and walked through the exhibit and where I went to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's house when she lived in Portland. Uh, and so I'm going to end briefly with um, the story of what happened to that great character after she left um, after she left Spokane in 1910, after this period that I write about in the novel, and how she ended up in Portland. Writing about uh, 
um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn during these years was to write about her at sort of the peak of her of her um, uh, of her uh, both her audacity, as I said, but also her her idealism. Um, she had not become cynical in any way. She had uh, she she was battling in all of these different towns: Missoula, Spokane. She came to Portland. Um, Seattle, um, the mining towns of Idaho. Um, after Spokane, of course, in Spokane, of course, she was, she had, had married a miner um, and he wanted her to return to Butte, Montana. If she had moved back to Butte, Montana, she would have lived in a miner's shack, cooked um, pasties for her husband who would then take them to the mine um, a mine, uh, a, a copper miner in Butte, Montana in 1909 um, had a lot, uh, an expected lifespan of 38 years. Um, she would have raised her son Buster there. He likely would have gone to the mine too. Uh, a labor organizer like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was really not welcome in a place like Butte. Only a few years later, Frank Little, one of the organizers she would work with, would be dragged behind a car, killed, and hung up on a railroad abutment with a warning for other labor activists in town. This was the life that she was considering as she was leading the Spokane free speech movement. Uh, she decided against it. She moved back to New York, an almost unheard of thing for someone of that era to do, to leave their husband and, and raise their child on their own. In New York, she, she worked on the Patterson Silk Strike. Um, she organized labor movements throughout the, the East Coast and the Midwest. Uh, and in 1917, the IWW was outlawed. And uh, over the next few years, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn found herself really pushed to the far extreme of American culture. She fell in love with a, a charismatic labor leader named Carlo Tresca. And um, despite, besides being a, a great labor leader, he also um, was something of a, a romantic whirlwind and not wanting um, to limit themselves by bourgeois ideas, um, they had sort of an open relationship, which ended for Elizabeth Gurley Flynn when he impregnated her sister. At that point, um, burned out by politics, um, beaten down by, by events like the one that occurred in Spokane um, and others, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was um, sick, uh, she was suffering from exhaustion, um, and she moved to Portland and moved in with uh, a friend of hers named Marie Equi, um, who is another one of those figures that I'm surprised uh, has slipped through history. Marie Equi was one of two physicians in female physicians working in Portland in the early 1900s, involved in free speech, providing birth control, and even doing abortions at the time. Uh, she was, she fought for suffrage, was one of the first openly gay women in Portland, in fact, was arrested herself in 1917, was called the most dangerous woman, the most dangerous person in Portland and was jailed for sedition um, because she, besides being, uh, besides being gay, she also um, was a pacifist who put up a sign saying that workmen were marching to their death. They fought in World War I. Marie Equi um, was raising her daughter who would grow up to be a famous female aviator named Mary Equi. And she and um, her partner, uh, an heir to the, to the Olympia Brewing um, uh, family, had moved out. And so Elizabeth Gurley Flynn moved in and helped raise Marie Equi's daughter and lived with her for almost 10 years. Um, regained her strength and ended up going on to um, uh, to found the ACLU, um, and then later, as many people who many people who worked in the labor movement at that time um, became a member of the Communist Party, um, and later became the president of Communist Party USA and died in the Soviet Union in 1950. But that that period of of her life when she was here in Portland made me so curious that I found myself driving by her house at 1423 Southwest Hall Street today and just parking in front of it. And again, that feeling of living history, of the world that we live in 
circling back and echoing and cycling through in some way was filled me because I could just imagine um, what it was like in that hit in that house above downtown Portland um, for this for this character for this person. When I was telling my daughters about the book uh, that I was working on, I remember telling them that uh, that there was a moment in which I realized I was writing toward a certain question. Rye, who is um, sort of the heart of the book, the uh, the soul of it in some ways, who's who is not who's not a uh, convinced entirely by this labor message, but lives a life that benefits from the activism of, of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. There's a moment late in the book when he finds himself asking her the question, how do you keep going? How do you do this when the things that you fight for don't come about? How do you battle when, when the odds always seem against you? This is what I felt coming from my children the last few years, what I often felt coming from myself, uh, a sense of, of uh, imminent defeat and, uh, and cynicism creeping in. And as I wrote to that point of the novel, uh, I realized what this walking history was about for me. It was looking into the past to try to figure out how to deal with the present. And I think it's what we all do as we read, as we learn, as we grow. We, 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 they're, they're, the only way forward is to see what's worked in the past and to see how people like these activists moved the, moved the world forward, even if it didn't arrive to the place they wanted it to. And I look, as I look at young people fighting for common sense gun laws or for climate change legislation, I find great inspiration in characters like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in their, both in their activism and sometimes in their fatigue. Um, in their needing to recharge, in their driving back up for one more battle. So I'd love to take any questions. Um, my favorite part, the part that I missed the most of book touring, honestly, was question and answer. Um, I used to go in the house after work and demand that my wife ask me questions about my work, but they were usually uh, too hard and I couldn't answer them. So. Um, so I'm going to gladly call on anyone who has any questions about the book or about writing. I will make a couple of caveats. Like Jeopardy, please form your question in the form of a question. Uh, and if it looks like it's going to be congressional testimony that you're giving, I might tug on my ear a little bit, a, sim a signal that you might want to round about to the... Uh, to the question part of your question. So, um, so if anyone has any questions about the book, about the film, uh, about uh, anything, please don't hesitate. Yes, back there. Yeah, okay, great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the Pinkertons are a fascinating organization. They're, like many things, they are neither good nor bad, obviously. During the Civil War, um, the Pinkertons worked um, uh, for the Union as spies. And so, in many ways, I think. Um, you know, you could consider that a sort of heroic moment in Pinkerton history. Um, later, though, during this period, much of the work that they got was as a sort of private security force, usually infiltrating um, unions and um, the Molly Maguires, the Irish nationalist group that um, that raised money for uh, for um, uh, for Irish independence, uh, and. There, there, are, there are many. There are, there's a great biography of um, of uh, James Parland, the the sort of famous Pinkerton, who in many ways informed the character of Del Delvo. Um, uh, many of them were from Ireland or Britain, um, considered themselves masters of uh, of uh, intrigue. Another great book to read is Big Trouble by J. Anthony Lucas, in which the Pinkertons. Uh, 
Pinkerton detectives hired by uh, various forces, kidnapped James uh, Haywood and others, and dragged them to Idaho, where the uh, governor, the former governor of Idaho, had been blown up and killed um, by anarchists. Uh, and so there's there's quite a bit of of writing about about the Pinkertons themselves. In Spokane, there were at the time many different um, agencies. The, it, the police worked in a much different way then. If, if a crime occurred, if you needed security, you often hired these private security companies. Over the years, during, um, during the last few years, groups like Blackwater have, have sort of taken over that role. And the Pinkertons still exist. The Pinkerton agency is still a private security company. Um, but in, the, in many of the ways in which detective fiction and police fiction work, they they had sort of been um, uh, they had sort of been uh, treated at mostly as heroic figures, as the as the lone detective out working. One of the one of the things in my research that I found the most interesting was um, Dashiell Hammett, the uh, author of um, of uh, the Maltese Falcon and so many great crime novels was a Pinkerton detective who lived in Spokane and worked on um, on cases in Montana. His novel Red Harvest comes out of the period in which he lived in Spokane, and that and he tells the story of of and it may be apocryphal. Lillian Hellman always believed it was ap apocryphal that he was offered four thousand dollars, I believe it was, to murder Frank Little himself. Um, later, Frank Little, as I said, was dragged behind a car and hung and, and killed and hung from a railroad abutment. And uh, Hammett always claimed that the mine owners offered him the, offered him money to kill Little. And so that that period, I I, I don't think there was a whole lot of honor in what the uh, Pinkertons did. Um, and so it was stories like Hammett's that uh, that allowed that for me it really opened that door. Yeah, back there. Yes. Of course, yeah. Could there be an HBO miniseries? Um, that's why I made the movie, because people, uh, can there be a movie made of this? This way I can say there just was one. So sure, it's only five minutes long, and I'm the only star, but um, uh, I hope so. Um, Hollywood's a, an interesting place. It's a very speculative place, and often something will get optioned or purchased, and um, immediately my brother will make me buy all the drinks um, because he assumes I've made a million dollars. But um, usually Hollywood uh, will just take a flyer on something, and uh, it, it's a lot easier to write something and not make it uh, than it is to spend all the money to make it. So that's a long way of saying that it's been optioned. Um, there is a TV possible uh, limited series that could come out of it, but it's for every one thing that Hollywood um, makes, it buys 15 or 20. And right now the cold millions is one of the 15 or 20. But the thing I'm really excited about is it's also been optioned by, of all things, um, a librettist and a composer who work with the Metropolitan Opera in um, in New York, and so they're thinking of possibly making a Cold Millions opera, which um, would be thrilling for me in a couple of ways. Number one, the thing about the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, was that they really prided themselves on their on being musical. The way they often protested was by song, and there's an incredible there's an incredible legacy of IWW songs. The, uh, the folk singer Utah Phillips was um, famous for bringing some of those songs into, into the 21st century, uh, into the 20th century, and then, and then later into the 21st century. And so, um, so there's a real natural musical background to it. And then an almost Les Mis quality um, to, to the poverty, to the issues that that I think are in the book. More than that, though, I have to think I would be the only kid from Spokane uh, who, ever, who ever started an opera, um, or at least one that makes it to the Met. So um, I can lord that over my friends that, uh, you know, sure, they can beat me at basketball, but where is your opera? Yes, in the back there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the book War and Peace, which figures so prominently in the book, and how it, how, uh, you know, was it important to me or just important in the book? And I would say both. It, um, uh, I mean, anyone who says their favorite book is War and Peace is just trying to impress you, you know? <laughs> so, but that said, it's my favorite book. So I'm clearly trying to impress you. Um, uh, the book, the book was important in a couple of ways. Um, one, it fit thematically. You know, it's it is the structure of that book is is in some ways mirrored um, in the Cold Millions. They're the same numbers of same number of chapters and sections and an epilogue. Um, so I was very much thinking about it as I wrote, and I was thinking thematically about it as I wrote. It is a story about what happens when um, history grinds over people and their concerns. And that's what happens to Gig and Rye. There's a moment late in the book when Rye says history is like a parade. Um, sometimes you're in the parade, but usually you're on the, on the sidewalk and the parade moves through and moves through your life. And that's how Rye thinks of it years later at the close of the book. Um, and, and so I very much was thinking about that model of of the way history affects people's lives. It also has a totemic um, meaning for the characters. Uh, I was so moved by the idea of what's known as the Great Hobo Library, which was a way in which vagrant workers could pack books in their bindles. Imagine everything you can carry is going in a bag this big, a shirt, a pair of gloves, and you take time to include a book in that it's that important to you and then when you sit around the campfire or um, the jungle camp with other with other vagrant workers you trade those books and in that way someone like gig no education no home could read nietzsche and rousseau and these amazing writers and they did some of these some of these workers would educate themselves in that way and i found that aspirational quality so moving um, and I, I gave Gig a quality that I had as a younger person and still do, the, the quality of the autodidact, that he's only read two-fifths of War and Peace, but he's already pronounced it the greatest work of fiction in the world, um, which I know I did several times as a 20-something-year-old. Um, and, and, and so it became, you know, looking for books that were published around that time War and Peace was one that I that I could connect with. Um, for me personally, I I started to read it once, and then I saw um, a play that um, many of you might have heard of or seen in New York called um, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet, later just shortened to the Great Comet. I happened to see it in this off Broadway theater, in which they transformed the whole theater into a Russian bar. And you come in and you sit at a table and they bring you vodka and pierogies. And the whole play erupts around you. The waiters are characters. Every, it's as if you're in a Russian saloon in, in, at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. And the whole, play, the whole play is happening around you. It takes a sliver of War and Peace. And it's that sliver in which Prince Andre has just fallen on the battlefield and believes he's dying. And he's looking up at the sky at this great comet that is, that is like a star up in the sky. And as he's lying there, he's thinking about his life and he's wondering why he cared so much what people thought and why he fell for these ideas of bravery and why he couldn't live a life of more meaning. And it was such a profound experience for me watching that play. I went back and read the book um, with totally new eyes. And for those of you ha who haven't read it, you have to just give in to it. Um, and so for me, it, it also became like, like gig, uh, a kind of aspiration. And, and the, the pride with which, the pride you feel when you conquer a book like War and Peace, um, 
you know, is, is really palpable. And I really felt that after I went back and read it the next time. I was so incredibly moved by it that I kept finding myself thinking about it and in some ways patterning this book after. Yes, down here. Um, that questions about the Big Burn, the Tim, wonderful Timothy Egan book, which was a fire that took place in 1910, um, and and figures briefly in the novel because I chose to write about Taft, Montana, which is one of the towns that was totally destroyed by the Big Burn. Um, Spokane really avoided any damage during that period. The fire came as the the fires, or many of them, um, came as close as Wallace, Idaho, which was um, almost, I think, 40% of Wallace burned in the Big Burn. But Spokane um, avoided trouble for um, for a few for a few reasons. It the the thick part of that of that forest sort of starts to peter out by then. Um, so it wasn't in the direct path of, of the fire. Spokane had also burned in 1889 and had mostly been rebuilt in brick and steel. Um, uh, so, so while the Spokane, while the fire got close, it wasn't really, um, didn't really cause that that uh, problems in Spokane. But, um, but it did. I, I was so excited to write about Taft, Montana, which um, there's a there's one episode in the book. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn goes there, and it's one of the few moments in which I. I allowed the fiction writer in me to invent because I don't know that she ever went there. She went all around the Northwest to many of these mining towns, um, but I so wanted her to go to Taft because I've always found it to be sort of the last horrible, stinking place in the West. Um, in fact, when Taft, before he was president, was passing through as defense secretary and they stopped in this incredibly ugly, seedy, um, vice-ridden, um, armpit of a town, he said this is maybe the worst place in America. And the residents, most of whom worked in brothels or sawing legs off, um, uh, were so taken by that that they immediately voted to call the town Taft in his honor. Um, and there's a, at one point in the, in the book, um, it describes how uh, it was built on, on park, on federal forest land, national forest land. And so there was no local law enforcement. So the forest rangers would come in every sp spring. And one spring, they found 14 dead bodies in the snow, most of them uh, victims of knife or gunshot wounds. Um, it, was, it was really one of the last lawless places in the West. And so when I was looking for places for Elizabeth Gurley Flynn to go and um, uh, and agitate for uh, for labor. It just felt like such a great opportunity to get to to write about that spot. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. How do you pick character names? Um, it's funny. I I have several sort of fallback ways. For this book, for instance, uh, the character of Early Reston, um, uh, I, I wanted names that, 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 that had sort of fallen out of the culture. Um, and there was an old baseball player named Early Wynn. Uh, and I love the idea of a character named Early for some reason. And sometimes they just stick. Um, with Rye and Gig, um, you know, I wanted two Irish brothers. I wanted that resonance in for, for the world we live in now. And so Ryan, his, his nickname was Rye, and Gregory's nickname was Gig, and I was so proud of myself for this Rye, this Rye um, joke about the gig economy, the, uh, the world we live in now. Um, so sometimes they can be sort of thematic like that. Um, uh, Ursula the Great was kind of an interesting one because as I was immersed in my research, uh, I was poring over all of the um, all of the uh, news newspapers from that time and reading the various um, uh, the various uh, um, 
uh, vaudeville theaters and who was playing in them. And when I went home that night, I had written down Ursula the Great Sings and Dances with a Wild Cougar. And I write my fictional ideas right next to my research sometimes. I usually indicate, I underline them if they're if I've made them up, but I, I could not remember if I'd made it up or if I'd seen this actual act. So I had to go back to the library and repeat my research, and I realized I hadn't seen it, which made sense, because if, if her name was Ursula, she would have danced with a bear, because Ursula is like Ursa, which means bear. And so then I had to make her dance with a bear first. Um, and then I had to solve the problem of how she doesn't get eaten by the cougar. And so it just opens all of these fictional doors. But for me, the, once I settle on a name, it kind of becomes that character. And probably the biggest problem I had with this novel was avoiding writing early and girly in the same sentence. Because you do not want an accidental rhyme like that. So anytime early is in the room, I call her Elizabeth for that very reason. So sometimes you can get stuck with character names that you, uh, um, that you don't uh, mean. Other times they're, they just, there'll be a sort of um, sound that you hear, Del Dalvo. I wanted this character um, to walk into a room and be different than anyone you'd met. Um, and, then, and then that character, um, you know, when you start to write them and writing these first person stories the way I did, um, allowed those characters to kind of almost rise up and, and announce themselves so that someone like Del Dalvo could say, Spokane gave me the morbs. And the very first thing out of his mouth, a sense of morbid dread that, that this city gave him. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question about switching back from first person and third person and um, how to know, you know, do I ever change them? How to know when, which one to, uh, to write in. This novel is very different because I do alternate those voices, but it, it was a very specific and clear idea of why I was doing that. If you look in the book, you'll see every first person section has a little curly Q water. Um, that idea that I was telling you about those undercurrents coming in, those tributaries coming into the main story. So it was very much structural writing those first person stories. Usually with a novel, I, I, I tend to like to, so for instance, Beautiful Ruins has a lot of characters. Um, and uh, a few times I, I, so for instance, in that book, I have Michael Dean's autobiography in first person, but that's because it's a kind of written artifact. Um, I don't usually vary within the piece like this, but as I'm writing something, a short story, anything, very often I will start to write it in first person and then think, no, I want to back up and tell this in third person so I can paint the world. One of the reasons I write Gig and Rye in third person is so I can write that big 19th century, that big 19th century style of writing where I can tell you the whole world um, uh, and not just through the eyes of these characters. So a lot of it will have to do with the scope of what you're writing. Um, but yeah, I often find myself making those changes. Sometimes I'll write something in past tense and I'll think, no, I want the immediacy of present tense. And then when I go back to write it again, I'll think, nope, it was better in past tense. And then I'll go, nope, nope, present tense, nope, past tense. So um, by the time it escapes into the world, it's been um, beaten around in almost every tense and point of view possible. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I'll re repeat this style. The novel I'm working on now, um, I'm imagining, uh, although I could change it, will just be first person throughout. Um, but moving through time, one of the things I really love to do in fiction, and one, I, one of the superpowers that I think fiction has is to take you through time, um, to give you the full scope of someone's life, um, the way hopefully I do it. Maybe take one more question. I want to make sure we, I get to sign books and get you all out of here. Oh, as soon as I say, oh, there is one more question.
Yeah, the question is, do I get different points of view on the story? There are so many things that resonate in here and, um, and, and so many sort of political hot buttons. And um, so the question is, do I get different points of view? Definitely. And I've had people engage me in great letters about, um, you know, about labor, about um, capitalism and, uh, and communism and, you know, all sort and uh, protest and anarchy and all kinds of great, of great things. And I take that to be such a great sign. Um, we've lost somewhat the ability to have civil conversations about these things. We, we believe that the other side is not just misguided or wrong, but somehow in the grips of evil, partly because they're in the grips of evil. No, they're not really. Um, and so I take very seriously the idea that you may not agree with me politically. You po possibly, probably don't. Um, but I think the great power of fiction is to put you in someone else's shoes. And if you want to wander around in someone else's vagrant shoes um, and, and, you know, and still have the views you have, I'm all for it. Um, personally, uh, it, that tends to change my view um, to read a novel. I'm reading a novel now that um, is set at, in an abortion clinic and she does such a great job of inhabiting the characters, not just the people who work in the clinic, but the protesters outside. And uh, again, I, I don't know that a novel's job is to move the political needle so much as to move the needle of the human heart, uh, to, to open doors to characters who you normally might not find yourself living with. Um, and in that way, I think that's really what, um, why we come to great libraries, why we seek out books is to open ourselves in that way. If you watch a movie, if you watch a TV show, you're all watching the exact same show. Your reaction to it may be different, but you're not playing it. You're not performing it. When you read a book, um, you live for three days or a week or two weeks in that world. Uh, and the words are only suggestions for you to form your own thoughts and ideas about those characters. It's very much like I've written a piece of music that you then play on the piano yourself. It's the most involved kind of, of story and narrative and entertainment there is. Uh, and the great thrill for me is watching people play the song differently than I would have, get different things out of it. Um, and so to hear from, you know, people that they think I'm, you know, a raging lefty who would lead the world to ruin. I, I love getting letters like that just as much as I love the ones that, you know, say how much they like the book and I answer them all. And, um, uh, and in that way, hopefully we engage in conversation, which is the thing that I think the only thing that can save us at this point. Uh, I'm gonna go upstairs and sign books. Please stop in. Thank you so much again.